And that's why for me, a table is always going to beat, you know, a billboard saying repent and believe. A table is always going to be any kind of strategy or, 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 or program or model. A table is an invitation into an encounter. Good morning, everyone. I wonder what are your favorite words to hear someone say to you? Have a think. What do you most like to hear? This question was asked in a survey in America a number of years ago, and they collated the responses. And the three most repeated answers to that question, what do you want to hear, were this. I love you. Dinner's ready. And I forgive you. It's interesting, isn't it? The desire for love, the desire for fellowship, the desire for forgiveness. These things are innate. These are desires deep in all of us. And as we've been exploring this image of the church as table over the last few weeks, these three things have kind of been haunting me because I... I can't help but put the two together and think the table is really the place where these deep desires that lie within each human heart, the table is the place where these things are met. And so this morning as we continue our table series, we're going to be thinking about the table as a place of radical inclusion. I love you. As a place of refreshment, dinner's ready, and as a place of redemption, I forgive you. And as we dig into the table metaphor, at each juncture, I want you to kind of be remembering and having in your head that there's kind of two layers going on with the table metaphor. So the table is, um, is there's the table of God. There's the things that God gives to us. He lays a table before us. And so God gives us the love and the refreshment and the redemption And then as with everything that we receive from God, there's also this call on us as the church to go out and do that for others. And so the table, when I say table, I want you to picture the feast um, that God has prepared for you and all that he's given you, but also the table as the church, right? As us, as a body of believers and what we are called to give to others. Does that kind of make sense? All right, let's dig in then. So we're going to read from Acts chapter 2 and reading from verses 42 to 47. And we've seen so far in this series that Jesus in the Gospels was always either at a meal, coming from a meal, or on his way to a meal. And as we jump over into the book of Acts, we can see that his followers, the early church, the early Christians, were following in that very same pattern. And so here we find them gathering. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. So let's start by thinking about the table as a place of radical inclusion. And I want you just to zoom out in your head a little bit out of our context. And when we talk about um, meals in this this early church context, we've got to try and zoom away from, from our context and our setting and think about what meals were like in the early church. And we know from history, and we've seen it in this passage, that the home was the central meeting place for the Christians. Okay, so they had some gatherings in the temple courts where there would be some teaching, some public discourse, interaction with people. But the primary place, the primary location for the the early church was in homes. And this was really, really unusual, completely unheard of in the ancient word. We mustn't miss the significance of what is going on here. Biblical scholar Nietzsche Gupta has written a book, in fact, all about the early Christians and how 
frankly weird <laughs> they were culturally on sort of every level. Um, and it's called Strange Religion. And he paints a picture of, um, of this world that the Christians were living in and just how radical this new religion is that is being formed around dinner tables. Because at that time, gods always had a place where they were worshipped. They always had some kind of a sacred gathering site, and they always had a name that identified them. And here we have the Christians worshipping a god, not in a religious space or sacred context, but in the heart of family life, in the home. And the name for their god that was most commonly used in the New Testament was Father. Again, not a religious term, but a family one, a term for the home. So something profound is happening here, a shift, a radical departure from other religious worldviews or understanding of worship or understanding of sacred and secular divides. And at the same time, there's this profound elevation and transformation of the most everyday intimate environment of the home and the dinner table. And so Nietzsche Gupta says this, I used to really underestimate why Christians met in houses. I used to kind of assume it was convenient. Now I don't. I think it was a testimony. It was a microcosm of an intimate family gathering with God. It was meant to broadcast. This is a whole way, different way of thinking about God. This would have been one of the most attractive but also most dangerous phenomena. For Christians to meet in houses wasn't just convenient. It said something about the way that Christians viewed God and the world around them. Archaeologists and historians have done a lot to help us understand the ancient Roman world. And it's important to remember that in this context, in this society, hierarchy was everything. Everything was about status and power, and meals were the, one of the places where this was most on display. Eating was this kind of social cue. It would tell you who you were, how important you were, where you sat, what kind of food you were served. All of it was part of this kind of dance of um, hierarchy and power. Now, in Roman households, you would have had... Um, so the, the house would have been large, and you would have had like an atrium area in the middle and you would have had a dining room that could seat about nine up to nine people and then you would have had maybe a further 30 that could meet elsewhere across the atrium and so you know in Corinthians when Paul is like blasting the church there saying you know some some of you are like getting absolutely stuffed and and getting drunk and meanwhile someone else is going hungry and you kind of think how is this happening at the same table but this is why, because you would have had literally certain seats within the, the household that would have been served food first, and everybody else would come second. And so, and so that's the kind of context that we're talking about here. Very strong social conventions on who sat where. And, um, and it's actually it's quite amusing when you read some commentaries of that time, because the, the comedians and the satirists were actually criticizing this system of Roman inequality in their dining practice. And you have one guy saying, um, so he's complaining about the quality of food at a dinner party. And he says, there was a fat turtle dove for the host, but only a magpie that has died in its cage <laughs> for the other guests. And, um, and then you have someone else, this guy Juvenile, who says, what a dinner, you'll get wine too dry for cotton wool to absorb. She's just a great, if you ever go somewhere and experience a terrible glass of wine, isn't that a good, take that with you guys, too dry for cotton wool to absorb. Um, but you, I want you to picture, I want you to picture this kind of society where you have such intense inequality going on at a dinner table within these different constructs. And this is the dynamic and this is the power play and this is the social convention. And then in walks Jesus. And the church begins and all the believers were together and had everything in common and sold possessions, to, sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need and broke bread in their homes and ate together. In a world of hierarchy, Jesus planted the seeds of a radically different reality. 
He constantly flipped the switch. He eats with all the wrong people in all the wrong places, subverts social orders, constantly ignoring social cues. At one point, he tells his disciples, don't go for the best seats. Like, don't go to those ones where you're going to get the turtle dove. Go to where the, you know, you get the magpie in the cage. (laughs) Pick the lower spots. And then he comes out with parables like the great banquet. And he says, all of you in the top table... It's no longer for you. We are taking it to the streets. Like this was radical and this would have been very problematic in this early Roman context. At the heart of the Christian faith is a boundary crossing love. And what I want you to see this morning is that table fellowship in the early church, it's not just a sweet sort of kumbaya moment or like a lukewarm church potluck lunch. The table represented radical inclusion. It's a a subversion of social hierarchy and a reorientation of religion away from sacred sites and into the heart of the home. But it's a home that says everyone belongs. There's a seat at the table for everyone. And this kind of inclusion, it's hard to express how radical this was and is. If you read in Galatians 3, Paul says this, There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. This gospel that we have just shatters through every line that divides people group, that divides genders, that divides ethnicities, the boundary lines, the inside out categories, these invisible divisions that we use to separate people and societies. In Christ Jesus, those lines disappear. And so the table is so much more than a table. It is a model of love without conditions. And if you spent time around Jesus, you would have got this from him. This message of love without boundaries just seemed to emanate from him. That's why he was so attractive to sinners and outcasts and screw-ups and rejects and so palpably uncomfortable for the good people, the religious people, the moral people, the people who were a little higher up the social ladder. You see, there's no ladder that the sinners could climb. They knew this. There was no way that they could meet any conditions. Whereas the good people quite liked conditions, right? Because they could meet some of them, or they felt they could meet some of them. They could attain certain standards. And along comes Jesus just upside downing every hierarchy. And his grace was totally disorientating. He prepares a banquet for the lowest of the low. He removes the conditions and simply offers love. That's why in Luke 15, we find one of the most beautiful lines in the whole arc of scripture. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. The religious mutter. But the the tax collectors, the sinners, the outcasts, the rejects, they gather to him. Something about this man, Jesus, made them feel that they could be close to him without being ashamed. These people who all of society made them feel dirty, made them feel that they should be somewhere else. Something about this man and the grace in his eyes just drew them to him. They couldn't stay away. Jesus is a man who something about the way he walked and talked, grace just seemed to leak out of his every pore so that, you know, you could have dirty hands, a filthy lifestyle, a sordid backstory, and somehow you weren't ashamed to gather to him. Jesus is the kind of man who, you know, you could be that woman with the terrible backstory, the terrible reputation. You know, the woman that bursts into this dinner party. You remember this context. You remember the social conventions that are at play here. This is not an acceptable thing to do. She bursts in. She throws herself at his feet. She has no right 
being in this room or being anywhere near this holy man of God. And yet there's something about this man, Jesus, that she has to gather herself to him. And she knew that she would be welcomed. How did he do that? How did he walk about the world and just emanate such grace that she knew she'd be welcome? Jesus was the kind of man who you could be Peter. You could be one of his best friends in the world, but you could betray him in the worst way possible at his lowest point, at his lowest moment. But then when you see him again, you know what it's like when you've let someone down and all you want to do is hide or run away? But with Jesus, Peter sees him and what does he do? He runs to him. Something in Peter just knew, looking at Jesus, he's going to welcome me back. Jesus is the man that gathers the sinners, the outcasts, to him. And Jesus welcomes you at his table today. Whoever you are, whatever your story, there are no conditions, no reserves to the grace of God, which says you are loved and there is a place for you at the top table. As the early church watched Jesus living like this, they tried to do the same at their own tables. And we are called to do the same. See, the table is where you can really see someone's priorities. It's, it's where your beliefs put on skin and bone, right? You, you really show that you mean what you're talking about. And as you think back over your most recent meals... Has your table been a place of welcome for people? Is there anyone on the outside of your own sort of invisible boundary line that you wouldn't have welcomed at your table this week? Or maybe you don't have a, a boundary line. Maybe you don't have that sort of culture or person or, or type of folk that you don't want at your table. Maybe it's not that you have a boundary. Maybe it's just that you have boundaries. And so your table is yours and it's your place. And, and boundaries are not a bad thing. Of course, boundaries are important. But if our lives are so maxed out and stressed and strained that our home has to, has to be shut down and, and closed off to everyone else, maybe we have to rethink some of our rhythms a little bit right, to make a little bit of space for others at our table. How might Jesus want to use your dining table this week? This is, this is radical, I know, but I do think it's one of the key ways that we can follow in the footsteps of Jesus today and live differently. As you guys know, and as Pete shared at the start, Adam and I and Thea and Noah are in the process of moving our lives um, over to Northern Ireland and it's with great sadness that we're walking away from here and great trepidation that we're walking into all that we're going to but as you can imagine it's quite complex trying to find you know a house and schools and all of it and we were over a few weeks ago and and talking with an estate agent about trying to find a place to live and she said well talk to me about your priorities what do you want in a house and we said look we're pastors and, um, and we follow Jesus. And so that means for us, hospitality is really key. And so what we really need is a house where we've got space for an extended table. We can host dinners for people. And that's basically our main <laughs> sort of criteria. Can you find us that? And she, just, she sort of looked at me and she went, okay, like, yeah, I, I sort of get that. But what you have to remember, Hannah, is you have to remember this is your home and this is your, this is your house, the four of you, this is your family. You need something that works for you. And then what do you have? Like maybe, maybe four or six times a year, you might have more than that run for a meal. <laughs> We're like, no, no, no. That, that, that's, this is radical, but but that our paradigm is, no, this is not our home. This is not just for the four of us. The table is a key place. Like, we're going to be pastors. And yes, part of that is doing this sort of a thing on a stage. But, but so much more of that is sitting at a table with people. That's where our lives happen, right? In the heart of the home. And so, and so where could you be extending your table this week? Because the second desire of the human heart is dinners ready. And the second layer of the table, it is a place of refreshment. Those two words, 
dinner's ready are my son Noah's two favourite words in the entire English language. He just loves dinner time. And from the minute, I promise you, the minute I pull out a chopping board and I start to prepare in the kitchen, out of nowhere, suddenly this tiny little person appears dinner's ready <laughs> with kind of the um you know that just like demanding but also adorable way that only a two-year-old can be demanding their dinner to be ready and I'll say no no I've got to I'm just starting cooking it'll be ready soon so off he goes to play but as the the meal cooks and you know the aroma begins to fill the house he just constantly is reappearing at the kitchen dinner's ready <laughs> and finally when the, the meal is ready to go on the table he is always without fail just stood by his little booster chair at the table on his tippy toes trying to see what's being served up and it's then his job to announce to the rest of the household dinner's ready it's his favorite moment of every day but they're great words aren't they dinner's ready we have said that it was not accidental and it was not incidental that early Christians met in the home, but it's not also accidental that they ate food together, that they gathered around meals. I remember John Mark Homer once saying that he was just knocked sideways reading through the New Testament and coming to a line written by the Apostle Paul. He said, when you gather together to eat... And John Mark Homer said he was like, you know, I, I, I knew there was sort of a Pauline framework for like prayer and, and, and worship together and teaching. But when you gather to eat, like this, the fact that this was so central to the life of the early Christians really challenged him to look at their practices and look at their regular weekly habits. A home cooked meal is slow. It's time-consuming. It requires thought and planning and shopping and, and dishes. And it strikes me that in an age which is so focused on performance and success and speed and achievement, slowing down to make space for a regular weekly meal to celebrate the grace of God and enjoy good food together and welcome others in, this could be one of the most countercultural things that we do together as a church. Eating together is a rebellion against a culture that's always walking forwards because it requires you to sit down. We're always, always relentlessly hurrying and moving forwards, but a good home-cooked meal causes you to stop. It is time-consuming, and, and eating together food and drink, which is good and enjoyable, I think it's a rebellion against a culture fixated with functionality. You know, food like like food is just so good. And then we have these these companies come along and they 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 put all the nutrients together into some pale little drink and they say, like, have that and you can skip a meal. Do you know what I'm talking about? Those kinds of things. I haven't tried them, but you just think you've taken all of the life out of out of something that is meant to be so beautiful and enjoyable and you've made it entirely functional. And I think in that kind of a context, we as a church can come along and say, we have a different message. We have a different purpose when it comes to food. It's a celebration of beauty. It's a celebration of God giving us such good flavors and textures. Two weeks ago, we, um, we, we went to eat at the Botha's house. And I'm pointing, they're not there anymore. They were there. Um, and, and they made the most amazing whole chicken in an air fryer. You didn't know that, you, I didn't know you could do that. It was just incredible. And, you know, Yorkshire pudding's like the size of your face. And, and, and just the whole thing. And, and we, Adam had preached that morning. We were tired and we just sat down and we were refreshed, you know? You know those tables that you get invited to that you just are refreshed? There's Marv and Wendy. They didn't have us around. They laid a table for us in a steak restaurant. Hello. That was an amazing table. And you just, you're, you sit down and you are refreshed. And it's a celebration of God and the goodness of God. And it is such a profound countercultural thing to do together. It's, of course, sacred. And that's why scripture time and again says, you know, they, that, that God uses this image of the table as an image of the way he blesses us. He prepares a table before me. 
And so as we enjoy the goodness of food together, we celebrate God, but we also, the aroma of good food, it kind of awakens a hunger in other people, doesn't it? Like Noah sort of smelling the food from somewhere else in the house, he comes running. And I think there's something about our, our, our table fellowship that can be incredibly missional in our world. Tim Chester says this, Around the table, we offer friendship and celebrate life. Our meals offer a divine moment, an opportunity for people to be seduced by grace into a better life, a truer life, a more human existence. I love that phrase, seduced by grace. And that's why for me, a table is always going to be, you know, a billboard saying repent and believe. A table is always going to be any kind of strategy or, 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 or program or model. A table is an invitation into an encounter. It's an opportunity to be seduced by grace. And, you know, there are so many lonely people around us. There are so many people who are so desperate for a table, people who are anxious, lonely, just longing to be seen and loved. Some people around you might be experiencing that right now, a deep hunger, and they might be experiencing a deep hunger for God and not know what that is yet. In a world that doesn't always know what it's hungry for, What would it look like for your life or your table to offer up an aroma of something different today, something kingdom? And this is what this community has done so beautifully. As long as I've been here, it's just been this beautiful place of the table being a place of refreshment. I know when both of our children were born, we had hot meals arriving on our doorstep every day at 5 p.m. for like weeks I'm talking like six, seven weeks of this, to the point where I actually had one of my neighbors come and ask me what is going on. (laughs) I think she thought there was some kind of illicit trading or, do you know, I really think she thought something dodgy was happening because every single day someone different was just appearing on the doorstep, arms laden with with meals. This this church has been an amazing place for, for, for community and refreshment. I remember when I was very, very early doors back in, in the day when we were meeting in a pub and Matt Davis, who's the pastor of Aldershot, he and I were living in a shared house and Tom and Naomi Brewer, um, they came to us one Sunday. We didn't really know them at the time and they said, look, you guys, you're just serving, you're giving out so much for the Lord and we see you and we just want to refresh you. And so we've got this guy who, he just has this great ministry of refreshing people and we just want to send him to encourage and, and inspire you. And we were like, okay. And so they said, he's going to come around on, on Sunday between two and three, some point between two and three, just be at home and just be ready. <laughs> and so if I'm being really honest with you guys, I'm like, oh. <laughs> like, the last thing I want is some kind of random weird guy coming and like praying for us. I can say that because Pete's not in the room. I'm like, I don't want someone praying. I don't want this. But so we were nervous. Like we just thought this is going to be really weird. We don't know what's going to happen. Matt is kind of skittish at the best of times, if you know him. So we're just there, like, really nervously waiting. We get this very loud knock on the door at 10 to 3, and we go and, and open it, and it's a Sainsbury's delivery driver with just crates of food for us, like amazing, delicious, really, really amazing food. And it was so much better to get food than prayer. <laughs> Again, don't tell Pete that I said that. But it was just refreshment, and, and that, that's what this, this community has always done so well, and it's so important to us. And I want to say I'm really aware that you might be here today, and that hasn't been your experience of this church community or of any church community. And I want to say I'm so sorry if that is your experience. It's been hard to find tables um, to sit at or people to sit at your table. And, and we wanna, we're really committed to helping people to find those smaller tables because as the church grows, it's harder and harder, isn't it, to kind of dock in. And so if that is you, we want to really encourage you, you know, join a collective, sign up for a team, come and speak to Peter or I, and we will make sure to get you connected in um, because it's really important to us that everyone here knows there's a seat at the table for you and there is refreshment waiting for you. So I love you. Dinner's ready. And finally, I forgive you. 
Isn't it profound that those words made it into the top three list? I forgive you. I think it shows a deep awareness that we all feel inside of our own uh, our own lives, th- this sense of brokenness, of, of fallenness, of, of our own mistakes. And at the table of God, we experience genuine forgiveness. It's why our scripture today said, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Because the table isn't a social club. It isn't just a place to find great friendships or amazing food. It is a place to be saved. It's a place to have your whole life turned upside down. It is a place to find genuine forgiveness, no matter your past, and to feel that redemption experience of being at the table. Because you're loved exactly as you are, but this love is not broad or vague or generic. It's specific because you're loved and you are forgiven. Jesus died to set you free, completely free, of any sin or shame, so that you are welcome, welcome, and deeply loved, and deeply set free. That shame that we walked in with has somewhere to go. And the process by which we receive the love of God, and we hand him over our shame and our sin, that process is called repentance. The Hebrew word for repentance is shuv, and it can be translated to return home. Isn't that beautiful? And home for the Hebrew people meant Eden, it meant delight, it meant living as God intended, with joy and flourishing. To repent was to return home. And in many ways, our table fellowship enacted in our homes, it's an immersion into what will be our ultimate home the final feast. It's a reminder to repent and to move towards the lifestyle, the values of our ultimate home. I want to um, invite the band back up, if that's okay. Um, I just want to take, just want us to take a minute to um, to reflect a little bit um, on everything that we've just heard. I'm aware I said a lot of words. But there are two layers to everything that we've talked about today. We've got, um, we've got the table that God lays before us. And maybe today you're here and, and it's just been a reminder of a sense of, I want to receive that unconditional love of that man, Jesus. I want to be the person that gathers to him, that, that draws close to him. I want to receive grace. I want that welcome that he gives. Or maybe for some of us today, it's far more the challenge of like, what if my table was about more than me? What if my meals could move beyond functionality? What if dinner time became a place where the kingdom was being enacted right there in my home. And maybe you just want to take a minute right now and offer, offer that table, offer that as a sacred space and offering to the Lord. You don't need to be an amazing cook. (laughs) You can have baked beans on toast. You can have whatever it is. A table that is offered with love is always going to be Um, filled with the presence of God, no matter how good or bad, often bad in my case, if I'm honest, the food that you serve might be. So just take a minute and commit that again to God. And then I'm going to, I want to pray for us. And Jesus says this in Revelation 3.20. He says, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. And so, Lord Jesus, we hear you knock today. We know that you stand at the doorway to our hearts and that you are waiting. And so we want to say we invite invite you in, we welcome you in once again. Would you come in and eat with us? Lord, we long for your grace. We long for your love. We long for that unconditional welcome. We long to look you in the eyes, the man with grace in his eyes. We look at you now, Jesus, and we say thank you for your love and your welcome. 
And God, we pray that out of the overflow of this table that you prepare before us as we fill ourselves and refresh ourselves with your presence, would you equip us to be a refreshment to others, to go out and to lay a table for our community, for our neighbours. In Jesus' name, amen.